Hello, my name is Walker and today we're going to do something a little different. This is just a little overview of guitar pedals for beginner guitarists with tiny demonstrations. Just so you know what it is exactly that you have or perhaps what you want to buy to keep improving your sound. And generally just what I wish I would have been told when I started looking into this stuff myself. So, if you're a beginner guitarist, welcome! Welcome to losing picks, breaking strings, problems with white noise, problems with your guitar buzzing all the time and messing up your intonation by pressing too hard or not hard enough. You really should have chosen the piano. Also, if you have a tele or a strat, just jump straight into the gate portion of the video and then come back, please. By the end of the video, hopefully you know what each type of pedal does, how to construct a basic signal chain and why we're putting things where we're putting them. But of course, music has no rules, so feel free to experiment. This guide is not comprehensive and is just meant to give you a general understanding of what you want from each type of pedal. If you want to learn what each type of pedal does from a technical electromagnetic standpoint, <laughs> there are some fantastic guides dedicated to each of these on this very same website, so let's get into it. Overdrives. If you are just starting out, you have a guitar and maybe an amp, absolutely the first thing you're going to want is an overdrive pedal. If you play any style of modern music from indie to pop to country, you are going to want one. The sound of a fully clean electric guitar is extremely unusual these days, and most guitars almost always include a little bit of overdrive. The way these work is that they usually have a knob for the volume that comes out of the pedal, just how loud the nose will be, and the level of distortion applied to your sound inside the pedal, and some tone controls. Now, if you want to play harder styles of music like contemporary rock or even metal, you probably want to start looking at a distortion pedal. Uh, for the purposes of musicianship, just think of this as a harder overdrive, as it takes your guitar from this little fussy, screamy deal like this... ...to a full-on roar like this. If you're not entirely sure which styles of music you would prefer to make, I recommend you watch some reviews. Some overdrive pedals can go hard enough to fill your hard rock needs, but a distortion pedal is not likely to be able to soften itself enough to play something like, I don't know, the Rolling Stones. The final pedal in this category is Fuzz. Fuzzes can sound great, I personally really like them, but they are very wild. They can make your guitar sound really muddy and unclear, they play very weird with chords, they are very unique and they have a lot of personality, but I do not recommend you start out with one of them as your introduction to dating up your guitar sound. A thing to note is that maybe you have a combo practice amp. These usually include some distortion effects in them. Do not make the mistake of thinking of the gain knob as a synonymous with distortion. We're going to be talking about gain later on and we don't want to get confused. Gain can lead to distortion, but they are two separate things. Reverb. The second thing you'd want just to sound good playing at home is a reverb, short for reverberation pedal. It might sound not as important, but really these two are at the core of a good sound. If distortion is what adds the color to your guitar, then reverb is what gives it size. Most professional recordings have some amount of reverb added to them, and though its effects aren't as obvious as distortion, their absence is really felt when they're not present. Reverb is the difference between this and this. And this. And this. If you make the mistake of googling... <laughs> if you make the mistake of googling reverb pedals, you will find that this thing is a mess. And whatever type of reverb you choose, someone is going to think you have glue just by that choice alone. All you really need to know is that reverb is one realm where the digital options simply cannot sound like the real thing. That doesn't mean they're bad, it means they're just different. Digital options have a wide range of style, but they mostly tend to try to emulate the two main styles of reverb, spring and plate. These are named for the mechanical ways they are generated in real life situations. All you really need to know is that spring has a thinner, more vintage sound while plates tend to be thicker, boomier, and something you'd associate with a more 80s big style of production. 
The main thing to know when setting up a reverb pedal is that you can usually affect the volume, the tone of the actual reverberation, and then the decay or how long does the reverb last. These settings can get very complicated very fast, so be sure to find the manual of whichever pedal you get. And with that, you have the core of a good guitar sound. Go play some Bad Religion or something and then come back. Phaser, Flanger and Chorus So these are the effects that along with a good reverb can tend to give your guitar some very glossy, dreamlike, floaty qualities. They all work on different principles and it's all very interesting if you're into acoustics. Phasing, as you can probably tell, is based on waveform phases. They all give fairly similar sounds, but they are their own things. Chorus has this dreamy, big, very stable quality to it, whereas flange can feel very aggressive and almost robotic since it kind of works by stacking your signal on top of itself, and phase is the one that you want for those big, whooshy sounds. Uh, once again, there is no real standard with these, but you can often expect a knob for how often these effects are being applied to your signal, how much, and the basics like ton and how much the effect is actually being mixed into your signal. You usually want to put these after a distortion, but before your reverb. There is also vibrato and tremolo, but those are also techniques that you can just do with your own hands, and though they don't sound the same, I think their names makes their sound fairly self-explanatory, since they can be compared to the actual techniques. Pitch effects and wah. Now this is where the really fun stuff begins. Uh, these effects can do anything from lowering the tone of your guitar to make it sound like a screaming child, to adding a bunch of cool additional notes on top of the one you're actually playing. These are usually affecting the actual signal quite heavily, changing fundamental things like pitch, so you want to put them early in the signal change so they are not being fed a bunch of garbage noise by things like distortion, reverb or modulation. Because they are so varied, it's hard to give great pointers on how to control them, but since they are tone and pitch based, that shouldn't be too hard if you know a little bit about music. Do be aware, most of these don't play very well with chords and are more engineered for lead line purposes. A big favourite of mine are polyoctavers and octave fuzz, which really make your guitar sound like the herald of a goddamn alien invasion. Do be aware that Octave Fuzz is kind of a selfish bitch, because it's such a wacky effect that adding it to your pedal board is going to require you to be very prudent with additional effects. Delay and Echo Okay, this one is easy. It's the welcome to the jungle thing. It's just the welcome to the jungle thing. Unlike reverb, which is meant to keep your sound wave bouncing around with the natural loss of definition of any space, delay preserves it somewhat and plays it back to you after a certain amount of time. These usually come with a knob that tells the thing how much to wait before repeating the sound, as well as how many times the sound will repeat, and how much will each repetition degrade, etc. These controls are perhaps the most straightforward out of any effect, since they all control fairly tangible variables like milliseconds. Delay is also sometimes called echo, and along with reverb it's considered a time effect, so it goes all the way to the end of your chain. It is recommended that you put it before the reverb, but it's really up to your specific situation to determine that. Cleaning up your sound. Compressor. Okay, so now you have a bunch of cool songs, you have a cool sound, you have an arrangement, and it's time to play live or record some demos. Uh, what you need is a compressor. Which if you're a fan of really dirty punk or old school metal like me, it almost sounds like a dirty word. 
we all know that nobody who records for Nuclear Blast is ever going to make a good sounding record again because they compress the shit out of their guitars. But look, live music and recorded and or broadcasted music are very different things. You're taking sound waves from the air and stuffing them into a tiny little box and then and stuffing them into a tiny little box and then broadcasting them through wires or a film membrane or a... Look, I don't know how speakers work. The point is, what doesn't sound like a mistake when it's being played live sounds really awful and uneven when you put it through speakers or record it. A compressor is meant to just even out the volume of your pick strokes a little bit. It makes the louder bits quieter just so it's more even. The usual controls of this are as follows. Threshold. What this does is determine how much input does the compressor require before it starts doing anything at all. Set it way too high above the signal and it won't fire at all. Set it too low and the entire signal will trigger the compressor. Attack and release are simply how fast the compressor will act once it receives the input necessary and then how long it will remain active afterwards. Ratio is how much it will smoosh down the pics of your signal when it actually fires and finally you have blend, which allows you to mix a compressed and an uncompressed signal just so you can strike a good balance between evenness and humanity. Compressors also tend to have a volume or a gain knob. What this does is allow you to control the actual volume of the signal leaving the compressor, just in case it feels too quiet or too loud after being compressed. A good compressor is perhaps the epitome of an effect that is meant to be entirely unthought of. It's just there to make everything sound smoothly and play nice with the other instruments, and the limitations of passing music through a bunch of magnets and wires and what have you. It usually goes after the next pedal on our list. Gate. The almighty gate. The redeemer of sins and deliverer of salvation. If you have a Telecaster or a Stratocaster, you need a gate yesterday. And if you play in very high distortion scenarios with other band members, you also need a gate. You can think of a gate as exactly that. A gate that lets your guitar signal come through. What the gate is meant to do is shut off all unwanted noise and static as soon as the actual notes you're playing stop ringing out. It is in a delicate fight with actually having your notes have any sustain. These usually have the same controls as compressors, with more or less the same effects. If you are having a lot of trouble with noise and sustain, you may want to look into multiband gates, which have different settings for different parts of the frequency spectrum, allowing you to target the specific noise you want to shut off with more aggressive settings, while letting your nerds ring out better. An absolute must-have for the working musician, and more vital than water for Stratocaster owners, God, I love my gate! EQ. It's an EQ. <laughs> or equalization pedal, it does what it says on the tin. Uh, this is in fact the reason I started doing this in the first place. As guitarists, it can often feel that we have way too much control over our tone already. What with tone knobs on our guitar, amps, pedals, but it is worth noting they all tend to be very broad. And as I had to learn recently, Having your guitar not turn completely to mud often requires you to cut with a lot more precision. I am not a producer or an engineer, so I cannot tell you if you need an EQ pedal for recording or if you should just go flat and have the engineer do all the work. Although on that note, if you are recording, get a direct box so you can rescue a clean signal in case you need to reamp later. But you do want it for live settings and it's just generally good to have around to keep your rhythm guitar sounding nice and clean and not like a wall of static. The controls on this are fairly obvious since it's just a frequency range. Just remember that a rule of thumb for EQ is to cut aggressively and add conservatively, since cutting usually adds more space for other instruments, which is generally the main purpose of an EQ pedal, whereas adding just highlights the charm points of your sound. EQ pedals tend to go straight at the start of the chain, trading places with compression to taste. And with that you have a working knowledge of most major types of guitar pedals and why you would want or not want to shell out the money for each type. You can go now, go with God my child, or stay for a few general pedal tips so you don't get lost in the endless flame wars of ultimateguitar.com. Uh, oh, on a side note, 
in this little diagram, uh, fuzz doesn't usually go in the same place as overdrives and distortion because it's a fuzzy bitch. It goes right at the start. It's going to make a bunch of your other effects malfunction and it's going to cheat on you with a guy who murdered you and is wearing your face and you will like it because fuzz is just that cool. True bypass. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> let's get into this. Oh my god. Uh, so if you're shopping around for pedals, you're going to see a lot of True Bypass labels and product packaging. And maybe you're going to think, ooh, True Bypass, just what I need. I'm sick of all those fake bypasses. Is that a thing? Uh, so what is True Bypass? Um, okay. <laughs> So this video is already super simplified and there is a committee of guitarists waiting to chop my head off already. Uh, but I'm going to have to piss off the electricians too now. Uh, okay, so basically cables are capacitors, right? Uh, what this means is that they take a high impedance signal into them and then there's... Um, okay, how about this? <laughs> um, the way an electrical signal comes out of your guitar, it's bound to have some loss of high frequencies if it travels enough of a distance inside cables, guitar to pedal to pedal to cabinet, etc. There are some guitar pedals that will turn your guitar signal into a low impedance signal. That kind of signal is basically immune to this loss of frequencies unless you were to cable it to the moon and back. This is called a buffer. Buffers and true bypass pedals are essentially the opposite. It's not that True Bypass is better. In fact, it is recommended to have a high quality dedicated buffer pedal right at the start of your chain to protect against this quality loss. Rather, the thing is, some pedals have some truly awful buffers included in them. Uh, so even if they're turned off, just having them in your chain will make your guitar tone worse. This is why True Bypass is such a big selling point. It's the we promise not to fuck up your tone when not in use sale, effectively. So once again, if you ever make the tragic mistake of asking Google anything about music, you quickly get bogged down in fucking effect elitism. Uh, but please remember that this is music. There are no bad ways to do things. There's just the sound you want to create and the most effective way to get there. Um, a lot of the effect elitism about digital boards like the Axe FX is that they can't quite replicate the sound of bespoke premium manufacturer pedals. But, um, they don't have to? It is ostensibly what they're trying to do. But again, this is music. See what you like. If you like pedal simulations, use pedal simulations. If you like manufacturer pedals, use manufacturer pedals. Just listen with your ears instead of your wallet or your forum history. A lot of musicians get really insecure about the gear they spend so much money on, or the one that they aren't able to afford, and just find it hard to speak about these things objectively. But keep an open ear. Pro tip, even people who make boutique pedals agree that a lot of cheap alternatives are indistinguishable from premium brands. And in the cases where they aren't, they don't tend to be worse, just different. Remember that the history of guitar distortion was a bunch of guys slashing their speaker cabinets with knives just to get this sound. And then we made guitar pedals so they didn't have to do that. So holding these things as a gold standard is weird. They're meant to replicate mechanical faults. There is no right or wrong way to make noises, it's just noises. We all want to share our pains and joys with each other and make music, so go out there and have fun. Thank you for watching.